All right, we're going to start the Dark Valley, the East Front Campaign, 41 to 45, GMT 2013 by Ted Racer. Now, I realized there's a deluxe version. When I first found that, I was like, well, why don't I have that? So I got online and I looked at it, and uh, I realized that uh, I like this map a lot better. Um, granted, I think the charts are a little easier to look at on the uh, deluxe version, but uh, this map just speaks to me, I guess. Um, I'm going to make a few changes in my initial setup for the Germans after reading the rules and understanding what the first turn uh, combat and move is for the Axis forces. And I think I have some ideas how to maybe get some holes real quick in these lines. I'm going to try it. We'll see. We'll see but what happens. <clears throat> um, Russian units all on the board. Kind of scattered to the wind here. All right, so Leningrad all the way up at the top. Up yonder. Come on down here to Moscow. Here in Moscow right there. Moscow, Moscow. Let's come all the way down here to Sevastopol. Down here in the Crimea. And then over to the Caucasus Mountains and the oil fields. <clears throat> all right, big supply-based game. Uh, the Axis have uh, supply depots that have to move along the railways. And you roll a dice. Uh, what phase? I think it's the attrition phase, or just I don't have to look that back up again. You roll a dice to see how far they can move, and then of course units have to trace supply to them. Then you have your Panzer groups, and they have headquarters units, and they have a unique ability where, on their chit draw, any unit that's within range can activate and perform actions, which is interesting. And they've got four of those: two down here. Well, there's two for Army Group Center, so there is the third Panzer Group in there. First Panzer's in the south, and you got second Panzer's also in the center. Of course, these aren't their uh, historical placements. These are, your, you set them up the way you want. And then fourth Panzer Group up top there. So, you know, the basic German strategy was north was to just fight their way through the Baltic states and then up to Leningrad. Hitler wanted Leningrad taken because he wanted to burn it to the ground. Army Group Center's initial strategy was straight up the road through Minsk, Smolensk, and then on to Moscow. That was the initial. Of course, we know that got changed in 42 when Hitler had him, or at the end of 41 when Hitler had him turn south. And then our group south was Kiev, which is right here. And then I believe it was on to the oil fields. Of course, the down here past the Caucasus and in the Caucasus. And then, of course, Stalingrad comes in with Case Blue. And the Crimea becomes a distraction. Uh, Hitler wanted that gone because they were bombing the oil fields over here in, was it Romania, in Hungary or whatever, and Hitler needed to stop that. I didn't realize the Russians even had an air force that could do that. Uh, there's more concentration of forces in, the, uh, in front of Army Group South, so their fights used a little tougher, while the center and north usually just kind of roll through their paces and push the Soviets aside and then circle a bunch of stuff. Um, of course, they never do get into Moscow, I've played a Gary Grigsby's War in the East a couple times, and I've gotten into, or four or five times, and I've gotten into Moscow once. And I held it, and then I had to, uh, then I bought a new computer and forgot to bring my save game over. <laughs> Wasted opportunity. All right, so first few turns are going to be a lot of German or Axis activity. Um, there's really not even any, uh, let me grab this sheet over here <clears throat> the uh, Russians really don't get any well they get uh, they get one move one counter attack on the looks like the first couple turns and then in August they get a Stavka 
Um, they have Stavka and they have uh, Zukov, excuse me, which I guess are Stavka's their Soviet command, and uh, they get they're they're kind of like the Soviet version of the Panzer Group headquarters. Just they're not quite as efficient, at least not early on. Um, the Panzer Groups really have pluses to what they can do, and that's gonna I guess that that's gonna demonstrate how fast they moved in 1941. Uh, let's see what else is there. You have tactical air, you have air bases. Uh, the Soviets have an air army, I believe it's called 8th Air Army, or 8th Air Corps, something like that. Uh, they'll come into play. Kit draw. Uh, the Germans have initiative on a lot of turns. The Soviets have initiative. Then there's turns you roll. I gotta look on the top, this chart up here to see. I don't... By the looks of the old chart there, it looks to me like they have the initiatives marked. The little red arrow to the right is the Soviet, and the sort of white line to black arrow to left means the German. And I don't see any that aren't. And of course, this thing, it, it accounts for Case Blue when Case Blue starts off um, on the 12th turn right there in June of 42. And uh, there's certain things that the Germans have to do to keep the game going. We'll get to that when we get to that. Alright, so we're going to get uh, started here and uh, we're going to try to update you as we go through each turn and give you a quick explanation. We'll see you after the first turn. So I wanted to record the end of the initial German or Axis combat and then movement uh, chits on the first turn in June of 41, just to take a look at the breakouts trying to encircle. So I realized as I started to do that, that only the units with the white hexes, like that 6-8 right there, with the white hexes behind their combat factor, actually emit a Zoc. So I was pretty much able to punch a hole and just run around all this stuff. So I think I've got all these things in place to cut off. Let's see. Now those get that guy up there will be. But these three, this guy will be. These two one fours won't because that guy's zone of control into this road hex right here negates the two enemy ones. Alright. Um, these two are cut off, he's cut off, these four are cut off, this pocket's cut off, this pocket's cut off, he's cut off, he's cut off, he's cut off, and nothing down here yet, because they got some, uh, pretty strong mech units down here. But I wanted to film that, if anybody sees something in this that just doesn't look right, uh, put me a comment down there so I can uh, research that and make sure I don't do it wrong again. One more quick look. And let's back off. So that's quite a bit of encirclement if that's legit. Okay, we'll get back at the end of the turn. All right, we're into the attrition or the where you recheck the isolation supply status of units or out of communication or out of supply units. And it's right before the end of the turn phase. So I wanted to video the number of units that are out of supply or isolated before I do the recheck. All right, you see the group there is out of supply because they can trace a line of communication, which is any number of hexes to a supply source. So they can literally go down this line through this gap and over to that railroad right there, which will lead off to the edge of the map. But they're out of supply because supply range is only five hexes. So you notice those two bottom units, they can hit that railroad over here. They're within five hexes of that. All of these units up in here, you can see them, all the isolated markers. So this is what it looks like before I execute this phase. 
and hold tight and I'll show you what it looks like after I execute this phase. All right, so now take a look at what it looks like. That entire front line, all those isolated units are now gone. So if they're still isolated, when you reach that segment, um, you check them. If they remain isolated, they are eliminated. Out of supply, they just stay out of supply. And of course they get um, combat reductions. So here's what it looked like. All right, so all those units were eliminated from isolation. A couple of mobile units in there. All these units were eliminated either from combat or, well, all from combat. Some of them from uh, the counterattack, the mandated counterattack, which, by the way, you roll 2d6, and that's how many counterattacks you have to execute. Legal, they have to be at least 1 to 3 or better. Uh, I think you will, if you can't, so like if you roll an eight, you have to conduct eight counterattacks at one to three odds or better. And if you can't do it, I think you have to eliminate units. I'll have to read up on that one. Uh, the German units, that's a, that was a straight combat loss. These three here were to, their, their losses because they were used to reinstate full strength to some of the four, six, four infantry units, which are guys like that right there if they they take a step reduction at the end of the at the end of any phase you can if they're adjacent to or stacked with two other strength points of infantry of the same type they can uh, reinstate to full and then you just move these units so it's still a loss you're just giving that you're just giving it back to this unit that has a zone of control effect so all right so that's what it looks like at the end of turn one so let's uh run through this here in just a minute all right, so we're going to review turn one of the Dark Valley. You saw the casualties over there already. So let's take a look at the progression. Obviously nothing down here, just some Soviet troops moving forward. Um, man, did they take a beating. Uh, these guys did not. Uh, some of the ones in the uh, southern front here, not sure what front they call it. It starts with a K, yeah, whatever it is. Some of them were able to get out. Uh, a bunch of them were cut off. Not quite as many as up in the, the northern sector. Uh, you still got a few that are out of supply. You got units moving forward. I guess we'll start doing replacements and reinforcements on this turn. So uh, The Germans have broken out to the southern edge of the Pripet Marshes. Uh, they don't quite have Lvov yet. But I got a feeling that that will be shortly <laughs> lived by the Soviets there. And they'll start moving forward. Um, trying to learn how to use these headquarters units. you got to make sure you, you have them in the right location. You notice Supply Depot. That one was able to move quite a bit ahead. This one only moved up one. Uh, this guy here moved up one. Just through brest This guy here did not get a chance to move. Because there was units sitting right there. Um, he'll get his chance. So, you gotta, uh, so Supply is going to have a big effect on this turn for the Germans. And really, neither of these two up here got a chance to move other than maybe one. Well, no, they didn't move at all. So I'm sure that'll change this time. All right, Soviets have set up their defensive line. Yeah, that's not going to hold very long either. These small units like this. Minsk is open, depending on who goes first, whether that gets taken or not right away. And then that'll isolate those. If the Germans get the first pop, which I believe they get initiative, they do. They will take Minsk. And they'll, well, depending on supply, they'll keep moving. Not a ton of troops in front of them, but I'm sure that's going to change. You've got scattered Soviet forces everywhere, but they're not very strong. So we'll have to see uh, what they can do for reinforcement and replacement this time. Um, the air. I love the air power rule. They, they, they made the counter mix very minimal. The Germans have five. With, with their bases, right? And so if they run a bombardment, I think they can do one or the other during a phase. So if they do a bombardment and they roll a four, five, or six, they go back to the base and they can be used for further operations during the turn. So that means you can use them to uh, 
Which makes sense because a lot of the attacks, the you, the Stukas were in support, in ground assault support, so close air support. So you, as, until they get put into a done state, they can be used over and over and over again during the turn, which is really cool and, and sure makes handling the air a lot simpler. And of course, the Germans have their air supply markers, which I haven't had to use those yet because on the first turn, they're in supply. Uh, zone of control rule. This is also very unique. You know, I've played games where there just is no zone of control because it's such a big scale. And then played games where zone of control is stops everything. Well, this one's kind of 50-50. Some units have zone of control. Like that, those units with the hexagon, white hexagon behind their strength, they exert zone of control. That stack of one fours right there beside them, they don't exert a zone of control. So you can just run right on around them. That's how the Germans are able to break out. Uh, turn two, the Romanian front will start to get involved. That's going to be interesting. Doesn't look like there's a whole lot of strength down there. So I can't wait to see how that develops. And I can't just see, uh, wait to see how the push here is going to go. Can the Soviets keep Germany out of Kiev? I need to sum up if there's any uh, victory points. I think there might have been one or two that was taken by the Germans. Uh, well, we'll see if the Soviets can set up a defensive line. I'll have to work on that one. All right, we'll get back to you after turn two. Thanks for watching.